All right, good morning, Bridgeport. How's everyone doing today? Lovely, lovely. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Park Community Church. Uh, uh, my name is Kevin. I am one of our band leaders here, and it is uh, my privilege. And uh, on behalf of the band and the, and the worship team and the sound team in the back, it is our privilege and honor to welcome you here um, to this service. Uh, if you are here for the very first time, we are excited that you are checking us out. Please. Um, if you didn't notice, there are refreshments and coffee in the back set up by our lovely Connections team. That is for absolutely everyone, so please help yourselves. Uh, if you are willing and able, I invite you to stand with us as we begin in a time of worship uh, for our service. And uh, before we do that, let me just open us up in a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for gathering us here today. We thank you for just this beautiful space here at the Zobi Art Center. We thank you. Um, that we are just able to worship you openly and freely and, and loudly without fear from persecution. And God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we remember the men and women that have given their lives over uh, years, decades, generations, so that we have the freedom to do that, Lord. So we are just thankful. We are humbled and honored to be here uh, with our family, with our body, with our church, Lord, and we just give you all the honor and glory and praise. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We love you and we commit this time in your hands. We pray all this in your son's holy name. Amen. All right, here we go. And one, and two, and one, two, three, four, five, and... sing together from the highest of heights from the highest of heights to the depths of the sea creations revealing your majesty from the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring The song that it sings and all exclaiming indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky Indescribable, indescribable, uncontainable. 
Just give him praise this morning. You guys sound great. All right, before we uh, close with one last song, um, let me just read this parable uh, for us from Luke 15 um, before we close out. This is the parable of the lost sheep. Uh, Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? 
And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Um, church today, Kenton is going to be preaching about God's relentless love for us. So let's close out with one more song that just talks about that. And what?
Jesus, we just thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your nearness. Uh, we thank you that no matter what we do or don't do, you see us, you love us, and you pursue us. I pray for anyone whose hearts feel far from you, that they would experience your nearness this morning. We love you. Help us to love you more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I am so glad to see your faces. You made it out during this very dreary Sunday. Um, if you can, please take a minute to greet your neighbor. Uh, if you haven't been here for a while, if you see someone new, please say hello to them. And if you need an icebreaker question, ask them if they'd be willing to venture out and play in the rain. I know we're really excited engaging in conversation with our neighbors, um, but if we can, let's head back to our seats. If you don't know me, my name is Carolina Campos. I am one of the members here at PARC. PARC is a family of interdependent churches unified in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to all until there is no place left. If you're new with us, um, there are little black square cards in some of the seats around you. Um, they have QR codes on them. Those QR codes allow us to, um, well, allow you to, you know, type in your email, let us get connected with you. Um, it's one of the ways that you can also get connected with our church to know about the different events that we have going on. Um, and also being able to do things like welcome lunches, the potlucks that we have. So if you are new with us, we would love if you checked out um, that QR code and got connected with us as well. Now for a few of our announcements. First, we have a new app park. If you did not get one when you came in, they are back by the Connect Bar. These cards have all of our events for their summer, well, for June, sorry. And there are a lot of them coming up, such as our worship night. We have this White Sox game that the Near South region plans to go to, and a school's out summer celebration, because yes, some of us are on summer break already, and I'm sure we're very excited about that. Or you're about to be on summer break if you're a teacher or educator. Uh, parents, I apologize. I know it might be a little hard for you, but it's okay. I'm sure it'll be great. All right. So for our second announcement, um, I also just want to remind you that this is Memorial Day weekend, as you probably know. And one of the things that I would encourage you to do uh, that we've been talking about for the last few weeks is seeking to bless your neighbor. If you need a reminder of what the blessing looks like, blessing is beginning with prayer, listening to them, uh, eating with them, serving them, and sharing your story. So if you don't know your literal neighbors around your home, as I, I feel kind of convicted by this because I still don't really know mine that well, um, this is a really great opportunity this summer to get to know them, invite them out for a walk. If you're having a cookout, invite them to come to your cookout um, and, and get to know your neighbors and talk with them and share your story with them. 
And now for our third announcement. Our third announcement is about Hands Across Chicago. So today, this afternoon at 6 p.m. Um, at Harrison Park in Pilsen, um, there will be a prayer event uh, that is going to be taking place. If you do not know about Hands Across Chicago, um, this is one of the events that we do every year. Um, due to the fact that Memorial Day weekend is known as one of the most violent uh, weekends in the city. Um, we, we come together with a ton of the different churches in the area to pray over our city and cover it in prayer. Um, Hands Across Chicago is an example of the church working uh, for and fighting for peace. And we would really love it if you joined us there today. I think the event is happening rain or shine from what Kenson is telling me. So um, bring a rain jacket, join us at the park so that we can pray for our city, for the different areas that experience some of the most crime in the city um, as we you know, go out and try to be a salt and light uh, to these neighborhoods that we're a part of. And now for our offering. Our offering is one of the ways that we, support, um, that we support our ministries here at Park. We give to honor God as faithful stewards, and as stewards, we joyfully worship God each Sunday by giving back to him what we have earned so the church can do meaningful work for God's kingdom. Um, there are various ways on the screen to give um, if you so choose to, so choose to, and there will also be offering bags coming around. Please join me for a moment of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day and for this time together as a church. Holy God, we remember with thanksgiving and gratitude the men and women of the military whose sacrifice have helped, us, have helped keep us safe and free. And we lift up the families and friends of those who gave their lives for their country and ask your healing spirit to bring comfort to those who grieve over this weekend. May we be inspired to be more abundant in our giving as we commemorate their lives of service. And as we enter the summer season, God, we also ask for your protection over our city, and especially this weekend, as we know there is so much violence um, each day. We ask that you move in the hearts of those that are lost or running from you and bring them home into your arms. We know that your love is relentless for your sons and daughters. Lord, be with us as we go out into the city this summer. May we be salt and light to those around us, proclaiming your love and who you are to all. Your love is greater than we could ever imagine. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carolyn. I'm one of the deacons here at Park Bridgeport. Today's scripture reading is from Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. So please open your Bibles to Hosea. Uh, Hosea is just a little bit after Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, if you're having trouble finding it. Also, if you do not own a Bible or don't have a Bible today, we have extras at the table in the back. So you may go grab one and take one home with you. Um, and also just a reminder, every Sunday we have deacons available for prayer after the service. So if you'd like to pray, I'll be at that sign over there after church, and I'd be happy to pray with you. So again, let's read Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jeho Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery and departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Debaliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo-Ramaha, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel 
that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but by the Lord their God. After she had weaned Lo-Rumaha, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo-Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will be reunited, and they will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, friends, once again, if we have not had a chance to meet, my name is Kenson. I serve as the pastor here at Park Bridgeport. Grateful to be with you all today to open God's word and also happy Memorial Day uh, weekend. Uh, as you all know, uh, today we are starting our first sermon in our summer long summer series in the Minor Prophets. Um, today we're going to be in Hosea. So before we begin, I want to let you know, especially for our families, that our biblical story today will have a mature theme to it. Uh, so parents, please use your discernment with whichever best way uh, you would like to disciple and care for your child during this time. Um, our loop is always open and they're always more than welcome to uh, be here as well too. But I just wanted to give you a heads up uh, on the mature theme uh, of our topic for today. So today we begin our series in the Minor Prophets, and these are the last 12 books of our Old Testament. Now the reason they're called the Minor Prophets is not because they're less important or significant than the major prophets like, you know, Daniel, Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah. It's not like we have varsity prophets and JV prophets. Uh, they're called Minor Prophets because in general, the books of the Minor Prophets are shorter and the messages are more succinct. And frankly, because they are shorter, they sometimes carry a much bigger punch. You know, for example, an espresso is a tiny cup of coffee, but it's super intense. It's way stronger than any standard Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Actually, any coffee is stronger than Dunkin' Donuts. Um, I always like to kid around with Dunkin' Donuts. It's, it's really more so like, you know, uh, sugar and cream and a side of coffee. That's, that's Dunkin' Donuts. So an espresso is a small cup with a big punch. The minor prophets do the same thing. You know, our plan for this summer is to cover most of the 12 minor prophets this summer. And we won't go verse by verse like we did with the Gospel of Luke. But what we're going to do is we're going to approach this more like a summary approach. We'll give context to the book and then focus in on a key theme. So with that, we'll be in the book of Hosea. Now let me start with this story here. Back in 1936, King Edward, King Edward VII of England gave a speech that was going to be carried to all over Europe and the United States through a radio station. A few minutes before that broadcast, someone from that radio station tripped over the main radio wire that was connecting the feed from England to the United States. So the communication was broken. And this was a massive problem only seconds away from this major speech. But a quick thinking engineer in the studio took one hand of the broken wire and with the other hand took the other part of the broken wire. And the next thing you know, the speech came through the radio. The radio signal literally transmitted through the body of the engineer. It was through this engineer the people heard the message from the king. This illustration is what a prophet does. A prophet speaks for God. A, a prophet is like a radio. It receives transmission from heaven and broadcasts that to others. Now sometimes the prophets do this in different ways. Sometimes the way they broadcast the message of God is through the proclamation of God's word. It's pure preaching. Other times it's prediction, it's, for it's foretelling future events, and sometimes it's through demonstration. The prophet acts out the role of the very message that God wants to communicate, and this would be our minor prophet today, Hosea. God would call Hosea to demonstrate God's love for his people in the worst 
possible situation. God tells him to marry a wife who would be unfaithful to him, that she would have an affair with other men and become a prostitute. And God would instruct Hosea to go after her and support her and forgive her and to raise their children together. It was through Hosea God would demonstrate his unrelenting love under the worst possible circumstances. Now, a little bit about Hosea here. His name in Hebrew literally means salvation. His ministry is about 40 years from 755 to 715 BC. So this prophet, this book, is fairly early compared to the other prophets. The prophet Daniel isn't even born for another 130 years. Now, the reason we know this is because in verse 1, it gives us historical context. It, we get the names of the kings of Judah and Israel. Once again in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Bari, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Ezekiel, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the sons of Joash, kings of Israel. So we know that Hosea's ministry is between 2 Kings 14 to 20. A contemporary of Hosea would have been the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah served the southern kingdom of Judah, and Hosea served the northern kingdom of Israel. Now what was happening culturally during this time? was spiritual apostasy, and it was leading to moral and social disintegration. That even though Israel and Judah were supposed to be God's people, the kings were unrighteous and were not true to the Lord and to the word of God, and this led to corruption and social injustice. One of the most famous verses in Hosea is from chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, Hosea didn't mean lack of education, like they needed more information. What they lacked was an intimate knowledge of the Lord, that they knew about God, but they were in a state of spiritual rejection of God. They had a knowledge of God that didn't lead to a growth in grace and obedience. This knowledge didn't lead to a personal relationship with God. What we need to see here is that the first step of their unfaithfulness was spiritual apathy. And this apathy will lead to their destruction by the Assyrians. So God raises Hosea to awaken the conscience of a nation that, 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 that Hosea through marriage would demonstrate just how unfaithful Israel has been to God. And yet God in deep agony remains faithful to them. So with that, let's unpack the story of Hosea, a prophet, and Gomer, a prostitute, and then afterwards we'll share some insights from these verses. So let's first look at verse 2 here. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So God tells Hosea to marry Gomer and to take her home and to love her. Now, this would have been really hard from the very get-go because prostitution is not seen as an honorable profession. This would have been a move at which everybody would have said like, whoa. Like in town they would have been like, what? This holy man, Hosea? This prophet of God, he's marrying an adulterous and moral prostitute? Why would he do this? This doesn't make any sense. But that's the whole point. God is illustrating to his people his loyal love despite their spiritual adultery. That Gomer is going to represent Israel just as Gomer has run off into the arms of other men. The nation of Israel has continually had affairs by worshiping other gods. But despite their unfaithfulness, God will be faithful to them and makes them his own. So Hosea marries Gomer, and they marry, and they have three children, two boys and one girl. And with each of these kids, they are given names to illustrate the relationship between God and the people. So in verse 3, so he went into Gomer, and the daughter of Dibana did the blame, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. Now Jezreel in Hebrew means God scatters. The name is a foretelling of what is to come that because of their spiritual unfaithfulness and rejection, the Assyrian Empire will come and conquer Israel and scatter them everywhere. In verse 6, they have a second child, a daughter, and her name is No Mercy. Literally, No Mercy. Wow, that's a rough name. I thought Kenson was a hard name. This is an even harder name. 
Now, God calls her no mercy because God will no longer add mercy to the house of Israel. Then in verse 9, we have the, uh, the third child, a son, and his name is translated to mean not my people. That once again, this highlights the limit of God's patience, that their sin eventually leads to rejection. So the story continues. Hosea marries Gomer. They have three children now. And we discover that she abandons her husband and kids and goes back to prostitution. Look at Hosea chapter 2, verse 5, the, the, the next chapter right over. It says this, chapter 2, verse 5. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. So she runs off. Now, at some point, if you're Hosea, enough's enough. God, you asked me to marry Gomer. We've had three kids together, and now she's left me and the kids to run into the arms of another man. I'm done. I am done. This would have been a very understandable reaction, and Hosea would have been biblically justified to leave her. But God says, Hosea, I want you to go after her. Buy her out of prostitution. I want you to take her home, forgive her, and love her. Look at Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 to 3 here. This is how the Lord instructs Hosea. And the Lord said to me, Hosea, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes and raisins, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and latex of bar barley. So God here would not give up on Israel. So God commands Hosea to symbolize his undying love to his unfaithful, life, unfaithful wife by redeeming her. Now, this word redemption is exactly what goes on here. This word literally has its roots in the slave market, buying someone from the slave market. And we see here that Gomer is being sold as a slave. So apparently, the man that she ran to was done with her and was now trying to sell her off. Now, to be in a slave market most likely meant that Gomer was standing in front of a, of a stage price similar to this, naked and exposed with various men looking to continue to exploit her. And Hosea is in this marketplace, and he fights for her. He shields her from these other men. He buys back his own wife. And he says to her in verse 3, And I said to her, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man, so will I also be to you. In other words, I'm committed to you. I bought you back. I forgive you. I'm redeeming you and rescuing you out of street. So I'm loving you and I want you to show me that same love. This is the story of Hosea and Gomer. Now with that, let me just give you a few insights from this story to help us understand the picture and meaning of God's unrelenting love. Here's the first insight I want to share with you. We are all guilty of unfaithfulness to God. We are all guilty of unfaithfulness to God. Now, I say all of us because that's what the Bible says in Romans 3.10. None is righteous, not one. We've all been unfaithful to God because we often love ourselves more than we love God. Sometimes we serve ourselves more than we serve God. Sometimes we value ourselves and other people and our stuff more than we value God. And God sees this as spiritual adultery. Adultery is when you give to someone else what you should find in your spouse. And one of the primary sins that God identifies in, in Israel is that Israel looked to other nations for help instead of God. Now let me just show you Hosea chapter 5 verse 13. It says this in regards to a, a rebuke towards Israel. It says this, When Ephraim, which is the largest tribe of, in Israel, saw his sickness and due to his wounds, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king, but he was not able to cure you or heal your wound. So here's what's going on. When Israel felt afraid, 
when they faced financial worries, rather than turning to God, they ran to the Assyrians and said, you've got to help us. Now, this does not sound that immoral, but Assyria was a godless nation. Godless nation. But there's, but, but there's even something even deeper going on here. But the sheer fact that they're running to the, the Syrians is showing that they just don't trust God. Their sin is our sin. We've let other things take the place of where God is supposed to occupy in our hearts. Let me ask you, where do you turn when you're worried and scared? What are you looking to ultimately comfort you? What are you looking to, for security? Where are you going when you feel lonely? Are you patiently waiting on God and doing things his way? Or do you take things into your own hands? You know, for example, around our finances and in the minor profits, God's going to talk a lot about our money, okay? So, for example, around our finances, the Bible talks about tithing, which is giving 10% from your first fruits. Now, God doesn't say 10% of your last fruits or 10% of your remaining leftovers or your abundance after you spent all your money on everything else you want. God says 10% of your first fruits. Why does God do this? It's because he's asking, who do you love most? Who do you trust most? God wants to be our joy, our delight, our confidence, and our trust. But like Israel, like Gomer, we seek these things in something or someone else. And our betrayal to God breaks his heart. In the classic hymn, Come Thou Fount, it says these lyrics. Let me show it to you. Oh, to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now like a fetter, like a chain, Bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We are all like Gomer. We are prone to wander. We're prone to please our flesh and our own desires. And we don't esteem God and adore him the way that we should. But this is the good news and the second insight to Hosea. God never stops loving us. God never stops loving us. Look at chapter 3, verse 1 again. And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes or of raisins. Now, please hear me. In no way is God giving a pass for their sins. There will be a high price for their spiritual adultery. In a few short months, they will be cast into exile by the Assyrians. But the point here is that even though God hates our sin, he never stops loving us. In the same hymn, Come Thou Fount, it also says this. Let me show it to you. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. God's posture here reminds me so much of what it means to be a parent. That as a parent, there are many times when I'm just not like, you know, the, 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 when I just don't like the behavior of my kids. As a matter of fact, this morning, they were acting in a way that did not make me happy. Now, just because I don't like it doesn't mean all of a sudden, I'm done with them. Like, get out of my life. I I don't don't care about you. No, just because I don't like it doesn't mean I stop loving them. I might be grieved by their bad behavior. There might be horrible consequences to their decisions, but I won't stop loving them because they're my kids. In the same way, God doesn't stop loving even though he is grieved. Now for Hosea, throughout throughout this journey of infidelity, He could have walked away. He could have walked away. Leviticus 20 makes it clear that a man in his situation could divorce his wife. He could even have her stoned for her unfaithfulness. This was a biblical loophole out of marriage. But God wasn't looking for a loophole. God's love drove him beyond what was legally required and even culturally expected. Now, if it wasn't already hard enough emotionally here for Hosea to go after his wife, Hosea would have been hurt financially to get his own wife back, to cash out and get her. 
I know this because in chapter 3, verse 3, that Hosea buys his wife for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and litek of barley. Now, the going rate for a female slave at this time was 30 pieces of silver. And we see here that Hosea couldn't afford that. If he could, he would have given all 30 pieces of silver. Instead, we see here that he pays half with cash and the other half in barley because that's all he had. He emptied out the bank account so that he could get his wife back. We see here that no matter the cost, Hosea was going to get her back. This is God's love for us. Like Gomer, we are shackled in our sin, and Jesus pays the price to buy us back. He pours out all his blood so that we could be redeemed. He takes all the lashings, the nails to the hands and to the feet, the crown of thorns, so that we can be free. God takes spiritually adulterous people and buys them back by his redeeming grace, and that is such good news. I bring no righteousness to the table. I bring no worthiness to the table. I, I, I bring nothing but my sin, and yet God loves me and pursues me, not because I am worthy of it or that his love is a reward for me being good. He doesn't love us because we're lovely. He loves us to make us lovely. God's love triumphs even over the greatest sins. You might think that your sins are too much for God to forgive. Be encouraged. Your sins can never put you beyond the reach of God's love. Nothing can. The blood of Christ cleanses the deepest of sins. And here's the final insight. God's unrelenting love gives hope gives hope. That even in the midst of Israel's unfaithfulness, there is glimmers of hope and mercy everywhere. And we actually see this most powerfully in chapter 2, verses 14 to 23. Now, I'm going to read this. We didn't read this earlier, but I'll read it for us now. It's one of the most tender and beautiful love songs in the Bible. Let, let me read this to, to, to you here. Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 to 23. God speaking through Hosea to the nation of Israel through their marriage. Therefore, therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a, day, a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. Verse 16, and in that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety." And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Verse 21. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and I shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil. And they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. In these verses, God promises to an unfaithful nation that a better day is to come. Now, this is ultimately fulfilled in the final return of Christ when he brings the new heavens and the new earth. But I want to point out a couple of things that we see in this wonderful song in chapter 2. First, there will be hope and safety. That God says in verse 15 that the valley of Achor will be the place of hope. Now, Achor is famous because this is where Achan kept some of the spoils of war for himself. And because of that, people will die during the war, you know, around the area of Jericho. Now God says here that this valley of Achor that used to be trouble will now be a place of hope. Why? Because I'm taking the trouble away. 
God also promises that you will come home to rich vineyards. In verse 18 and 19, God says that he'll even make a covenant with the beasts in the field and break every bow and sword for your safety. In other words, when you come back to me as your husband, when you come back to God, you will find paradise. I will remove all war, all conflict, all violence. I will even make a covenant, a pact with the animals to keep them from harming you. This is what God has for us. Don't run off to other gods and idols and lust. Put away your sin and come to God. Everything that you yearn in your soul is found ultimately in him. And in verses 19 to 20, God says this to his unfaithful wife. He says again in verse 19, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. What God says here is that God will renew this marriage and consummate the marriage again in purity. Three times God says, I will betroth you, betroth you, betroth you. I'm going to take you back to the days of our engagement. We're going to start over. We're going to build a fresh new foundation for our relationship, a relationship of righteousness, justice, steadfast love, mercy, and faithfulness. This is such great news for Gomer, for Israel, and for us. Because of God's great mercy, we too can experience a new start. That before her husband, Gomer was not seen as a slave, not as an adulterer, not even as a sinner. These things were once true of her, but now because of God's great mercy, she has a new start. She will not be identified by her past. She is unconditionally loved. What God says to her, he says over us who are in Jesus, you are no longer the same. Yes, you might have a past. Yes, you sinned. Yes, you are guilty. But Jesus takes all of it to the cross and pays the debt and dies on the cross so that you can be a new creation. Verse 23, and I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. Remember the names given to Hosea's kids as judgment? Well, God says judgment will not have the final word. He's going to change all of that. No mercy to mercy. Not my people to my people. This is the story of God's amazing grace. You were going in one direction and God turned it around. In Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul says this. Let me read it to you here. And it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. But God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. This is Gomer's testimony. This is your testimony. This is my testimony. I was this but God, and fill in the blank. I was this, but God, fill in the blank. That is our testimony. We all have a testimony of hope in Christ. Now with that, what's some application for us here? Let me give you two applications to this story. First, return to Jesus. The heart of Hosea is an invitation from God for you to return to him. Now, for some of you, God's been trying to get your attention by exposing how empty your life is, just like he did with Gomer. Let me actually read to you from Hosea chapter 2, verses 5 to 7 here. And this is what God says in his judgment towards the nation of Israel through Gomer here. Verse 5, chapter 2. For their mother who has played the horror, she who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, 
I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but she shall not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. What God says here is that when Gomer goes back to her old way of life, when she goes off and runs into the arms of other men, God is going to put a hedge of thorns around her. This is a metaphor which basically says that when you go back to sin, you're going to be miserable. It's going to be painful. Life is going to be hard. Now, maybe initially sin is fun, but in the long term, it is never fun. It always asks more than what it gives. Life is going to be hard, and eventually Gomer is going to get to the very pits of life. And it's in this moment we see here that she will realize her need for her husband. Is God doing the same with you today? The emptiness and brokenness and frustrations of life, is that starting to overwhelm you? Can I just let you know that this is not God pushing you away? It's so that you would know that you would return to him. When Gomer returns back, she will find that her husband will hold nothing back. He will not keep her at a distance. He loves her and forgives her. In the same way, when we come to God acknowledging our brokenness and sin, we will see what we saw, what we saw with the prodigal son, with the parable of the prodigal son. The father will embrace you, will put on the family ring, put on the robe, will big, give a big celebration. It's when we come in humbleness and brokenness, we will find our deepest union with God. Come to him today. Return back to him. And here's the second application. God's love transforms Gomer's into Hosea's. Gomer's into Hosea's. Now, the example of Hosea is not just that God loves us with an unrelenting love, but it's also said so that we could be a reflection of that love. This is the example of Hosea, that when you look at Hosea's life, when you see how he goes again and again and again to pursue his wife, you should be thinking of God. In the same way, we who have experienced the love of God, we now extend that love to others. Now, our situations might not be as dramatic as Hosea, but we've all had people who've mistreated us, taken us for granted, betrayed us, been unkind. Go again and again and again, and again. Seek to change the gomers in your life. Now, you might not always be able to change others, but even though they might not change, you will be changed. You will become more like Jesus. It might be hard to believe, but the gomers in your life are there to make you more like Jesus because then you will know firsthand the incredible depths of love and sacrifice and tenderness that your Savior had for you. You know, I think this hymn says it best, and I'll close with this. It says, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be, oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. You know, before I pray for us, I'd love to, again, just as we often do after a message, to give you a few moments for you to respond back to the Word of God. You know, what is the Holy Spirit prompting in your heart to pray? Is it to confess your sins before him? Is it to praise God for his incredible love for you? Or maybe for some of us here today, you have not professed Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Is today that moment where you confess him and make him your Lord and Savior? to embrace the love that he so freely gives if we would just humbly come to him and recognize our sins and our need for forgiveness. 
So let me just give you a few moments to do some business with God, and then I'll pray for us. No, Father God, you know, earlier we sang the song Reckless Love. And God, we know, it, we know theologically, biblically that, God, that, you're, that you're, you're not reckless, Father, that you're intentional, you ordain things, you predestine things, God, you're sovereign over all things. We're, we know that you're not reckless in that way. But, God, it seems reckless to us because your love is so amazing. Your love seems so countercultural. Your love seems to have no end. No matter how far we might go with our sin, no matter how much we might walk away, that, Father, you are never more than a prayer away. Man, that seems so reckless. That, God, that many of us would never do something like that for someone who hurt us so often and so much. But, God, yet here, yet here we are with the prophet Hosea and his marriage with Gomer, and that's exactly what we see, that in agony you love us. Father, would you overwhelm us with that grace? Would you overwhelm us with that mercy and tenderness so that we, first off, won't take advantage of your love, but secondly, Father, that we would be a reflection of that love to others. So, God, as we'll sing in a little bit, God, bind our wandering hearts to thee. Lord, we feel it. Our hearts are prone to wander. God, help us to stay close to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kenson. Please, uh, please stand with us as we close. And just in the, in the way that Kenson encouraged us to close with, with those two songs he mentioned. So let's sing together. Take it soon. 
sing together. We're singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Let's clap together. All right, here we go. I stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean let's sing that again sing i stand amazed i stand amazed in the presence of jesus the nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean we're singing how band one more time. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for coming to our service today. Um, remember, if you are in need of prayer, we do have deacons off to the side to pray with you. If the spirit is moving in you, if you feel like you need God to just uh, be in your heart to bring you back home, please go over there. They're really, really wanting to pray with you. So please go do that. Um, they 
Also, remember that we have our prayer event today at Harrison Park, 6 o'clock. Um, so please be there if you're able to. Probably bring a raincoat because it's going to be raining all day. Um, and now look up and receive this benediction. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are loved. Go in peace.